It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 274 at block height 692,809 on Monday, July 26th. What is up, guys? Are we, are we finally back into a stable recording groove? Is this is this going to last? I don't know, but I think so. Like this, this is like it's supposed to be the day. Maybe it's not the time, but we're here together. So I think we're all here. How are you guys doing today? Bullish bull market and block digest. Yeah, uh, our volatility might mimic Bitcoin's volatility, but remember, people, that's a good thing. Of course, there's a price rise with the return of block digest. Well, at least for the recording. We'll see how the airing goes. 21 EMA slap down. <laughs> Well, I can't help it. When everyone else gets bullish, I have to be a dickhead. Um, I'm just an asshole like that. I mean, haven't we proven that Bitcoin both is ESG and is not Chinese over the last couple of weeks? We're just killing it over here. Yeah. It's certainly been a lot of buying territory. I've just been looking at the price, trying to stack if I can, because, my God, it's crazy, though. They see people... I mean, like, whenever we were down low, just like a little bit, like a couple of days ago, people were like, oh, Bitcoin, who gives a shit? 20,000, 29,000, 30,000. It's like, come on, this is incredible that we're getting this dip opportunity. Yeah, I uh, appreciated somebody in here who uh, quote tweeted me back, back uh, where, where I said Bitcoin, $3,000 an hour because we were going up. And uh, they hopefully added to the conversation that this time it was $4,000 an hour. It's pretty good. All right. Well, outside of the price, there's been a lot going on, stacking up on the news desk, too. And some of it uh, returning back to some of that crazy regulatory talk we were talking about, but now in the form of trying to hit the, hit the bips with it. What's happening? Car yeah, so um, this fucking moron, Carl uh, Kivoski from General Bytes, he wants to, to make an official BIP um, for a URI formatting supporting the FATF travel rule protocol. And like this, this is just like I saw this. And it was just like, lol, there's an idiot on the mailing list again. When are they finally going to start like banning people from posting on it and shit? But um, yeah, David Harding. Like, Jesus Christ. Um, he actually responded on how to go about that. And then just had a very tame, but I don't think your BIP will get it. Like, go fuck yourself. Like, oh my God, that is not a Bitcoin protocol BIP. That is a fucking thing obligated to businesses for business regulations, not the protocol itself. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, why was that not completely ignored or totally ridiculed? Like, that is not a protocol issue. That's your fucking business's issue. So get the fuck out of here trying to conflate that with even application layer shit for the protocol Bitcoin. Like, no, that's your business compliance problem. Bitcoin downgrade proposal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I saw this and was just like, okay, so the, I mean, then this is where I take the F FATF like a little seriously. It's like their plays are a little crazy and sometimes they send in people and 
you know, they have this infrastructure built up and they're like, well, I'm just trying to do the thing that I need to operate, you know, legally in my jurisdiction. But it's like this is an attack on the whole value proposition of Bitcoin. So, I mean, sorry, little operator, but this isn't. Yeah, it won't go through. And somebody probably should have let you know that was a stupid thing to put forward, even on the mailing list. Just a discussion about it. It's a joke. Like, seriously, there need to be better moderating policies for that mailing list because, like, the past year or so, just randomly, like, the stupidest, most idiotic bullshit just starts becoming a time-wasting thing for developers actually trying to use this mailing list to keep up with serious proposals or coordinate with each other to some degree on such things. Like, moderate it. Right on. Well, outside of that stupid news, there's some more stupid news coming out our way. Go, go, go. So, you guys know the office of the comptroller of the currency? Well, they will propose rescinding changes to the Community Reinvestment Act rules made in May of last year, 2020. They say they're working with the Federal Reserve Board and the FDA. IC to put forward joint rulemaking to strengthen and modernize the CRA. The CRA, or Community Reinvestment Act, was enacted in 1977 to encourage insured depository institutions to help meet the credit needs in their local communities, including low and moderate income neighborhoods. Then last year's rule worked to preserve this important objective by responding to dramatic changes in the banking industry since the law's enactment and regulatory changes in 1995. The final rule addresses the shortcomings in the current CRA's regulatory framework that has not kept pace with the banking industry advancements and ensures the regulations no longer adversely affect the very communities the CRA was intended to help. So there's a brief synopsis of what was put forward last year, and now it looks like the OCC is planning to rewrite all the rules written last year. And this is all getting swept in up in modern politics since the OCC position appointed by the president. And, of course, Biden officials want to redraw anything Trump officials drew up last year. And I'm not really holding my breath thinking the modern left is going to improve the banking situation flow in moderate income neighborhoods. But uh, on July 20th, acting comptroller of the currency, Michael Hsu, said in a statement, quote, The disproportionate impacts of the pandemic on low and moderate income communities the comments provided on the board's advancement notice of proposed rulemaking and our experience with implementation of the 2020 rule have highlighted the criticality of strengthening the CRA jointly with the board and FDIC. While the OCC deserves credit for taking action to modernize the CRA through adoption of the 2020 rule, upon review, I believe it was a false start. This is why we will propose rescinding it and facilitating an orderly transition to a new rule. I look forward to working with the other agencies to develop a joint notice of proposed rulemaking and building on the AMPR proposed by the board in September of 2020. Close quote. So it sounds like they aren't planning on just rescinding the rules of last year, but completely redrawing them in their own image, which this is just the aggravatingly slow pace of government trying to keep up with markets while also trying to make sure they have a vestige of revenue and control through regulatory capture. The AMPR discussed in the statement from Michael refers to work that's been going on since 2018 to have government coordinate with industry to create favorable legislation for users, it seemed. If I was trying to set up new corporate infrastructure in crypto through state legislation put forward, I wouldn't be happy with these potential changes. It really sounds like there's a potential rug pull moment for all these other networks that are operating in a LARPing DeFi way. Now, if you're working with Bitcoin or Lightning, it's very hard to say how this could impact you. As we know, the jurisdiction, if the jurisdiction is hostile to Bitcoin, those individuals could pick up and leave from more favorable areas. So the story feels... A little bit like I'm reporting on the overlords finding their way into a system they could control and compete with China's CBDC. But what do you guys think of this? Will we see more heavy-handed regulatory regimes coming forward? Is this uh, Um, something that we should pay attention to? This, like this specific thing first hit here, I think is just very, very loosely tied into this space. But there were a lot more direct declarations from the OCC, like the clarification that banks were allowed to custody funds, offer products like based on Bitcoin and other cryptos um, to take deposits, offer like safe to, or 
like safety deposit or vault storage type services. Um, like there were other decisions, literally just banks can plug into the Bitcoin network right now. And that's been happening a lot with like, especially NYDIG, you know, FUD brought up and went through in the last episode is doing a lot of work to start plugging like all these banks together using Bitcoin as the rails for that. Like if they walk all that back, like this could start fucking with a lot of shit in progress right now and also move to the point that it just acts as a barrier to a fuck ton of capital coming into this space that have been waiting for these types of rails and products from institutions like that to get into this space yeah i mean it feels that way just as somebody that's been kind of on the sidelines for a year it's been pretty incredible to see like a trip you know like major players coming into bitcoin and we're there's like, yeah, like FUD was supporting last week. Like there's lots of like institutions that are built on Bitcoin rails. And I'm sure a lot of that had to do with the 2020 rule that was put forward. So, I mean, I'd imagine because like you're saying, a lot of it has to do with the way banks interact with different assets and loan stuff. So, I mean, it seems like uh, this is going to hurt the industry here in the United States pretty heavily. I mean, like wherever they can, you know, push their jurisdictional thumb down. I mean, it's going to hurt. Yeah. I mean, like if they walk back bigger, like crypto related shit, that could get fucked up. Yeah. Part of me sees this as maybe entrenched banking interests getting their way in this brave new world a little bit. Uh, in that anything that isn't easier is by default in their favor. Yep. Thanks, Coinbase Legal, bro. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Yeah. So, what's going on with the new news of El Salvador? Well, um, Bukele and his brother are talking about issuing their own stablecoin, uh, the Colón dollar, which was their national currency before they dollarized um, in the early 2000s. And, you know, honestly, I think this could be an insanely fucking good thing. Um, if they do that, then effectively they can digitize fiat based payment rails um, that aren't Bitcoin denominated, like baked into Bitcoin only, like dependent on Bitcoin to get financial services to people. And if you really think about it, um, this removes so much risk in terms of regulatory or um, like regulatory or sanction exposure to the US financial system. Like we, we've seen you know, a few little incidents here since they passed this piece of legislation where the IMF is not looking too kindly at them. The U.S. is now like trying to associate um, the Bukele um, administration with a number of other corrupt politicians in that country, in that region. Um, like, you know, as long as they're dependent on U.S. financial infrastructure, they can get fucked with. So if they make their own stable coin and bring that back, with this piece of legislation, hopefully, if they successfully attract or with mining operations start accumulating Bitcoin and then also have physical cash USD that is already in the country, they can play a very interesting game using Bitcoin and physical USD cash reserves um, in combination with a stable coin that they control the monetary policy of. So this that starts opening a lot of doors in terms of giving them a little more control back in terms of their own monetary policy but also removing a lot of risk in terms of if the u.s doesn't like what they're doing they can fuck with things on the fiat financial infrastructure side of things which you can't really do with a stable coin that they're operating themselves so like th this, I think, could get very interesting if this happens. It's great to hear. I mean, like uh, all the development there, 
I would imagine it's going to be uh, a lot and the market's going to pick what works best. And it's good to see that there's something that, you know, they can issue and work with better than what they've got currently. It seems like this is a natural market once you decide that you need digital dollars or digital whatevers, uh, the, the banks or the fintechs, the whoever ultimately provides those. And uh, it kind of smells like a system that could work or could come into being in America, but they completely co-opted it for El Salvador. Um, and it's because in a locality, you could definitely, uh, you do just related to regulating financial services, bias towards those that you regulate that are typically inside of your jurisdiction there. So this is uh, this is really interesting if they ultimately ship their own stable coin. Well, yeah, I mean, dude, you're building out like they could build out digitized fiat infrastructure on their own that is not dependent on Bitcoin shit, natively compatible with Bitcoin shit as well. And then you have the fucking the the game where like they have physical fucking cash dollars down there. So no matter what the U.S. does to fuck with shit, I'm sorry, that's still physical cash that can be brought someplace and it will be recognized as physical cash. Um, so that becomes like a really interesting game of like you, you, you have the option to back your stable coin with that cash and not just something like Bitcoin, which can get crazy volatile. So like that, it, that's it's like... That's a new interesting model to think about. You know what I mean? Imagine if you had a fucking stable coin that was partially collateralized by physical cash within the country in bank vaults, as well as Bitcoin. Well, you could just imagine it wouldn't even have to be physically collateralized in generic bank vaults. It could be so far as physically collateralized inside central bank bank vaults because they're the yep. ones who actually get to ring and ask for physical cash and they could ask for a billion dollars or however much a big old plane holds you know um wow this is a potential future for stable coins and or cbdc's and or whatever we call it, digital dollars yeah and it can definitely help you know, just I would imagine it's going to help the average day El Salvadorian over time try and uh, use the marketplace. Yeah. I mean, you know, like the, if you like the poorest people who go hand to mouth, they don't have money for Bitcoin savings like it's comes in, goes out. And you know like a purely like digital thing like a stable coin but that is controlled within that jurisdiction not something like tether that can get pressured a little bit or like circle with usdc that will roll over backwards or gemini usd where their shit can just get frozen and fucked with because the u.s government goes do it and all of those things are designed to be able to do that like El Salvador ain't gonna fucking just fuck themselves like that. And as far as the risk of like the government trying to do that to like individual people, like that applies to literally any type of digital financial infrastructure except self sovereign Bitcoin applications. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's where I'm thinking that, you know, this is going to be good. And especially in the development of El Salvador's Salvadorian citizens' lives. Like, I know that, like, um, I know that I've seen some people discussing, like, this news is like, oh, well, it doesn't reflect, like, uh, you know, the new, the price or something doesn't reflect the size or whatever. And I know there's a lot of... Uh, you know, mixed feelings on who's implementing it and, you know, their past and what they're doing on other sectors and everything. But, I mean, overall, I think that this is going to be a net good for the people of El Salvador. And well, I mean, it I doesn't mean, make it worse. 
if you have an El Salvadorian PayPal, they can still freeze your account. Like your bank account, smartphone app, they can still freeze your account. Like even if a stable coin system is set up like that, it does not make it in any way worse than any other form of digital banking would. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of news with uh, its development, and we'll be covering it the whole way. But, I mean, like, uh, just continuing on with the news, like, there's some very people, some people that are not so happy about all this Bitcoin news like we're talking about. So what's going on there? <laughs> okay, so this is just going to be a really funny, quick thing. Um, so there was a whole, I think on the, the 20th, yeah, um, about a huge... Um, anti-bitcoin protest in el salvador and like you know it's it's the socialists and the communists getting a um yeah if you look in the show notes you can see the initial conversation about this and then bitcoin beach um posting a tweet from yesterday where you can see the entire thing is like literally just 20 or 30 people um and all of the shots from around the 20th the 21st and so on were very very tight shots but the the one bitcoin beach posted it's literally just like 20 30 people standing outside a fence um yeah i don't think that constitutes like signs of mass fucking anger about this um and i say that as somebody that's pretty pretty certain that at least a majority of the the people down there are at least skeptical of this law since it's been passed but um yeah 20 or 30 people freaking out does not show like mass anger and fucking like active um opposition to this bill yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's all sorts of, uh, you know, propagandist style attacks to try and uh, discredit what El Salvador is doing and try and just hamper the uh, development. So, you know, it's good to see guys like Bitcoin Beach, uh, you know, those guys um, just putting it on blast, showing it for what it is. But I do believe it is now time for your mandatory homework assignments to be read aloud to the class. I wrote a paper about Tether. No. Oh. <laughs> well, boys and girls, as you may have heard over the past little while here, more Tether, tether FUD hath cometh. So, evidently, uh, the headline makers of the broader headline making world have come back to the idea that Tether FUD is relevant and a way to get notice on the headline making scene. Um, I don't quite know what to say other than this seems like it's, it's a little bit played out. And honestly, even skimming what's going on, I don't exactly know what the FUD is supposed to be this time. But Tether executives are said to face criminal probe into bank fraud. And I thought it was really interesting, Tether's response. It's a scant, it's, we'll call it three paragraphs, but it's like five sentences. That basically says that Bloomberg has published an article referred to as news. And that there are continued efforts to discredit Tether will not change their determination to remain leaders in the community. So guess what, Bloomberg? You're not going to kick Tether out or make them ashamed about the community. They will continue to remain strong in the community of stablecoins. Tether routinely has open dialogue with law enforcement agencies as Tether, including the U.S. Department of Justice as part of their commitment to cooperation, transparency, and accountability. I mean, this sounds like a stand-up organization all the way around. Um, I, I love that we're talking about a Tether headline when Bitcoin just went up like $10,000 over the past couple days. But anyway, Tether. Here's, 
it, dude, it's like it it blows my mind, like how many numpties in this space fall for this the same nonsense. Um, what do you personally think is more likely, Bud? That tether is literally printed out of thin air, or that a lot of people um, use tether that the U.S. government doesn't like having exposure to the U.S. dollars, so they're just really butthurt about that. I don't like either of those options because I don't think either of them are actually good options. Um, the whole, like, should we be skeptical about what Tether's assets are? Uh, Tether has the least U.S. dollarized assets. They're the most uh, distant from actual physical U.S. dollars of all the stable points. But ultimately, it hasn't been a problem for them. Um, yeah, but I'm just saying, like, out of likelihood, do you think that they're actually just printing money out of thin air or that a lot of people, say, from China... Second air. ...use the... <laughs> exactly. So I don't even think the U.S. government is mad about all the people from China using Tether. In fact, of everybody in the world that actually uses Tether, they are the very most happy about the billionaires in China that use Tether to escape communist capital controls. Very happiest. Happiest ever. Because those dollars flow out, they fund other businesses around the world, and honestly, they probably stay pretty black market. But some of them come over and invest in U.S. real estate one way or the other, I would bet you. So, you know what? They probably don't mind. I just have a feeling that the U.S. banking system has been waking up to... Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, stable coins eating their lunch lately. And that is the reason we see renewed tether fund. Yeah, it's, it's almost like all of those banks and their correspondent networks were a bunch of fucking giant douchebags who for no good reason refused to forward money for people who wanted to put it somewhere and do cryptocurrency stuff. And so things like stable coins and tether the very first of them were invented um to get around this fact and people actually were okay with using that and now all these banks are really really scared that their constant omniscient omnipotent control over the fiat side of arbitraging literally any market in the world is slipping away they're getting very terrified and butthurt yeah, if you're J.P. Morgan Chase, say, and you're looking at this little internet company called Circle that barely makes any money on $100 billion of assets that they trade around the internet in their name, uh, you are envious of how much they clear on top of their business model, as small as it is. And second, you notice that their business model essentially directly impairs your business model for U.S. dollars in your custody being worth anything. So, yeah, I, I, we're just at this interesting point in the cycle where it may well be in the game theoretical interests of banks and other financial institutions to start striking out uh, the ones that are tied into the old system of what dollars mean against new system actors, not just in the Bitcoin sense, but in the US dollar sense, or maybe particularly in the US dollar sense. And uh, nobody knows how the game will play out long term. It may well be that longer term, things like Bitcoin ownership end up being incentivized by those banks because they're willing to custody that sort of ownership for you. Yep. Well, I expect to see a lot more Tetherfoot, to be honest. Dude, I'm just getting so sick of it. It's like the peak epitome of stupidity. It's like if you really think Tether is shady, um, stop irrationally screaming and shrieking about how they print billions of dollars out of thin air just to artificially manipulate the entire cryptocurrency market, even though that 
money is a tiny, tiny fraction of the float. Like it's it's just ask yourself what kind of criminal organizations like having a digital dollar like that that they can zip around quietly or you know what types of politically plugged people or wealthy you know billionaires or millionaires might want to bypass their own country's capital controls with something a little more stable than bitcoin and just start asking questions like that so that at least when you call yourself a tether foot or sorry a tether skeptic um after you're done finally explaining you know your views to people um they'll know you're not a complete idiot good luck with that yeah well what massive stupidity exceeding even that of the money printer out of nowhere idiots is going on in the eu currently do you mean well I'm not sure how much of it is stupidity and just, you know, the regular legal practice of um, shoving lots of ambiguity into your rules so that you can do what you want. But on July 20th, the European Commission published a package of legislative proposals to, according to them, quote, strengthen the EU's anti-money laundering and countering financing of terrorism rules. The package also includes a proposal for the creation of a new EU authority to fight money laundering. It is part of the Commission's commitment to protect EU citizens and the EU's financial system from money laundering and terrorist financing. The aim is to improve the detection of suspicious transactions and activities and close loopholes used by criminals to launder illicit proceeds or finance terrorist activities through the financial system. Yeah, they left out of probably the giant gaping hole of intelligence services and the military, but who cares? Um, they note that the legislative package will be discussed by the European Parliament and Council. The Commission is hopeful for a speedy legislative process. The AML authority should be operational in 2024 and will start the work of direct supervision slightly later once the directive has been transposed and the new rules start to apply. So this is not stuff that has been put into law. This is just proposals and there's going to be plenty of time to debate it and maybe even kill it. Um, so this is just proposals at the moment. Um, but in the introduction of the proposal text, starting on page 10 of the English version, they write under measures to mitigate the risks of misuse of bearer instruments that, quote, the proposal contains provision preventing traders and goods and services from accepting cash payments of over 10,000 euros for a single purchase while allowing member states to maintain and force uh, lower ceilings for large cash transactions. The ceiling does not apply to private operations between individuals. The commission must assess the benefits and impacts of further lowering this threshold within three years of application of the proposed regulation. The provision and custody of anonymous crypto asset wallets are prohibited. Companies that are not listed are prohibited from issuing bearer shares and are required to register those shares. The issuance of bearer shares is only allowed in intermediate form. So important that there's a uh, also a cash, uh, anti-cash provision included in this next to crypto stuff where uh, they are going to further restrict and harmonize the restriction of using cash for large transactions. Of course, note that they specifically say it does not apply to private operations between individuals. It just means if anything you want to buy, uh, uh, goods. If you want to buy goods or services and it's over 10,000 euros, you cannot uh, use cash for that. So, yay. Uh, scrolling. The war on cash. Uh, and then on page 32, within the main text, uh, it says, quote, the anonymity of crypto assets exposes them to risks of misuse for criminal purposes. Anonymous crypto asset wallets do not allow the traceability of crypto asset transfers whilst also making it difficult to identify linked transactions that may raise suspicion or to apply to adequate level or apply adequate levels of customer due diligence in order to ensure effective application of AML CT CFT requirements to crypto assets it is necessary to prohibit the provision and the custody of anonymous crypto asset wallets by crypto asset service providers. Now, um, this is the part that stood out to people because they're like, what is a crypto asset wallet and what is a crypto asset service provider neither of these are defined in the uh in this proposal but we will get to that in a bit um under chapter seven measures to mitigate risks deriving from anonymous instruments they argue that 
credit institutions, financial institutions, and crypto asset service providers shall be prohibited from keeping anonymous accounts, anonymous passbooks, anonymous safe deposit boxes, or anonymous crypto asset wallets, as well as any account otherwise allowing for the anonymization of the customer account holder, owners and beneficiaries of existing anonymous accounts, anonymous passbooks, anonymous safe deposit boxes, or crypto asset wallets shall be subject to customer due diligence measures before those accounts, passbooks, deposit boxes, or crypto asset wallets are used in any way. So this is kind of a, this is not a crypto specific thing. This is kind of a broader effort to basically say, you should not be allowed to use a money. You should not be allowed to use money anonymously. Now, the key term, um, as I said before, is crypto asset service provider, which is not defined directly in this text, but there is a reference to a previous proposal for a regulation of the European Parliament and of the Council on Markets and Crypto Assets, amending Directive uh, 2019-1937, which uh, I will reference to now, just a second. So um, in this other previous uh, proposal, it defines in uh, Article 3, a uh, crypto asset service provider as any person whose occupation or business is the provision of one or more crypto asset services to third parties on a professional basis. They further define crypto asset service. So any person who, per who offers a crypto asset service, they define this as any of the services and activities listed below relating to any crypto asset. A the custody and administration of crypto assets on behalf of third parties, the operation of a trading platform for crypto assets, that's B, C, the exchange of crypto assets for fiat currency that is legal tender, D, the exchange of crypto assets for other crypto assets, E, the execution of orders for crypto assets on behalf of third parties, F, placing of crypto assets, G, the reception and transmission of orders for crypto assets on behalf of third parties, H, um, providing advice on crypto assets, and that is probably the most ambiguous of all uh, all of them in that list and by providing advice they define this further by uh, to they define this further to mean offering giving or agreeing to give personalized or specific recommendations to a third party either at a third party's request or on the initiative of the crypto crypto asset service provider providing the advice concerning the acquisition or sale of one or more crypto assets or the use of crypto asset services now that is I would still say a bit ambiguous, but it seems like the gist of what they define as a crypto asset service is a business that does custody or trading or uh, like this last example, providing advice kind of sounds like you're a broker for the custody or sale of crypto assets. So they're not saying just any ser any service or any any wallet that deals with cryptocurrencies, at least... I mean, it could be interpreted that way, but it seems mostly they're focusing on exchanges. Um, and then there's another part a little bit further down. One second. Um, I think I actually know it was earlier in the text. Um, earlier on, it states in the original, this, this new proposal that was just published this month, it states that uh, a crypto... No, the, no, actually, this is... Yeah, this is the, the old one that they're referencing for the definition of crypto asset service provider. Um, they kind of split it into two categories, and they say a first category of services consists of ensuring the operation of a trading platform for crypto assets, exchanging crypto assets against fiat currencies that are legal tender, uh, blah, blah. The second category of such, such services are the placing of crypto assets, the reception or transmission of orders, execution of orders, um, any person that provides such crypto asset services on a professional basis should be considered a crypto asset service provider. So that paragraph really does like focus on like a trading or exchange kind and custody kind of service. Um, so that clarifies it a bit. Um, and then I think this is back to the new proposal, this one that was published on July 20th. Um, there's a key paragraph in, I think, line 51. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think this could be either one, but it's in paragraph uh, number 51. I think this was the new one where it says this regulation should not affect the possibility for persons established in the union to receive crypto asset services by a third country firm at their own initiative where a third country firm provides crypto asset services at the own initiative of the person established in the union. The crypto asset service should not be deemed as provided in the union where a third country firm solicits customers or potential clients in the union or promotes or advertises crypto asset services or activities in the union 
It should not be deemed as a crypto asset service provided at the own initiative of the client. In such a case, the third country firm should be authorized as a crypto asset service provider. Um, so I, as far as I can tell from that, that means that just because like if you are a person living in the EU and you are using a service, a crypto asset service provider in, for example, the United States, that service in the United States, they're expecting it to be, you know, registered uh, as a crypto asset service provider in that country, but they do not necessarily have to seek permission from the EU or be registered in the EU just because they have EU customers. That's how I'm interpreting that. Um, if anyone wants to jump in and maybe I'm not interpreting that correctly. Um, but uh, kind of the ambiguity got clarified a bit because the day after this new proposal was published, the European Commission explicitly clarified that they do not think this applies to virtual asset service provider type businesses, uh, or this does apply to virtual asset service provider type businesses that we've talked about before. They go by the shorthand of VASP, and it does not apply to non-custodial wallets like Wasabi, especially privacy wallets, um, if there's no custody or exchange of crypto assets which aligns with previously established policies like those that were shared by Europol. Um, so at this point, we don't have to necessarily worry about non-custodial wallets, which again, unsurprising, um, guess what? It's hard to censor or impose rules on software that you can just run on your own, and especially if you have your own keys. Um, however, I still think we should be wary about the looseness of the language used because it could be expanded in the future uh, if they please. Um, and there's a good thread by a Dutch banking digital money expert, uh, Simon Lelevit. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I, I don't know how to pronounce Dutch names, but it's linked in the show notes. He has had a lot of good commentary on topics like this. Yeah. It's the One slow thing sorry but just real quick like what one thing that kind of blew my mind just a little bit looking into this was seeing people start freaking out about the fatf recommendation to maybe not allow withdrawing to self-hosted wallets in their terminology um because the yeah. regulatory risk was too high and that's been in there since the first draft and i i was kind of shocked uh about how many people saw that little citation of that section and were freaking out about it like they saw it for the first time like that's literally been there since the first draft yeah that's what i was about to say this is a slow march of the travel rule and its implementation across uh every exchange that they can uh, or platform that they can you know, corral everyone in to. And uh, that seems to be one of their plays as far as trying to just regulate people that are in Bitcoin or in, you know, in these exchanges. But like we're saying, I mean, there's the non-custodial aspect. I mean, they haven't been able to touch, but they certainly have the language for the, <laughs> since this, you know, push to implement this is the language has been like, hey, like we're going to, you know, find out all the identities of these wallets and then those that we don't know we're going to try and make sure those transactions don't go through and i mean we've seen that recently with trying to make travel rule compliant blocks and i mean this this shit is it's coming from every angle i mean you know they call it a, a crypto asset service provider but it sounds exactly like the virtual asset service provider stuff yeah that's a bit confusing to me of why they feel the need to basically use the same made up term that like the FATF has been using, which is virtual asset service provider and now changing it to crypto asset service provider. Like why not just use the same term unless there is a very, I, I, I would have to look more closely at the language to see if there's a very clear distinction between the two. Maybe they're not the same thing and they feel the need to use different words slightly, but a VASP sounds very similar to what they are describing as a crypto asset service provider. It's basically someone who has custody of other people's funds at some point or another. That's what it sounds like to me. So that's what a VASP is. Well, um, I'm going to venture a guess. What is it? Uh, lightning stuff. 
that isn't purely non-custodial. Um, like from my understanding, unless it's changed, um, Breeze does not actually implement proper submarine swaps in terms of an atomic swap. It's actually trusted um, where you just make a lightning payment to them and kind of trust them for that period until they broadcast an on-chain transaction. Yeah, but uh, good luck teaching the nuances of that to these people. <laughs> like, are they even going to notice? Mm, never, ever, ever underestimate your enemy because that's, in one way or another, something that most of the easiest to use popular lightning wallets, um, in one way or another, are guilty of. Um, so could all potentially get fucked by. I... Yeah, I mean, yeah, don't underestimate them, but also in the grand scheme of things, because Lightning is known as a micropayments network, I mean, there's been some recent experiments with larger amounts of Bitcoin over Lightning, but because Lightning is mostly promoted as a micropayments network, they're going to see that and think, okay, small amounts of money, um, maybe maybe a problem, but not worth the... Uh, the the overhead of like trying to go after that whereas if i expect them to go more into that stuff i would expect them to go for privacy wallets and come up with something for that because that's a much bigger they perceive that as a much bigger threat that's not how bureaucracy works though you have to work in some degree under the existing regulations the existing classifications to go after people and try to use that as a basis to expand new shit to go after things. And quite frankly, strictly speaking, that short period where I just give Breeze, from my understanding, again, unless they have changed from the initial implementation, your payment over Lightning, before that transaction hits chain, they're custodying your funds and you're trusting them. Yeah. This is just bad news for, you know, development and trying to stifle it because definitely seems like, uh, you know, this I swear I just I know the FATF and this travel rule has been a long push and it's just it's permeating everywhere and it's it's scary towards uh, developers and everything they're working towards. But I mean, uh, just keep hoping that, you know, there's definitely going to still be uh, jurisdictions that are going to favor the privacy aspects and the uh, and the sovereign aspects of using Bitcoin in a non-custodial way and also trying to help set up their citizens that way. I mean, if that is the case, please do, I guess, incentivize uh, the further development of non-custodial versions of Lightning Wallets. Rock yeah, in a hard place, guys. Scalability and just complexity. All right. Speaking of complexity. Right. Oh, is it autism time? Hold I on, think I need another so. beer for autism time. One second, I'll be right back. Oh my god. Autism hour. Wait, wait, you need beer to engage autism? <laughs> well, it's a blind signature, so you gotta get a little blind drunk, I guess. I think you're doing it incorrectly. I think you're doing autism incorrectly. Okay, so, guys, this is seriously the fucking biggest breakthrough or improvement, um, potentially, to the flexibility and security of multi-sig setups um, I've seen in fucking forever. And all I have to say is I really hope that there's no weird fringe thing that I'm missing um, that would break this with music two and um frost which would be like the two of three instead of three of three version of a, a schnorr based multi-sig but um a, a big problem with multi-sig if you do it right you are actually spreading um different word seeds around to different places maybe different people and um yeah that kind of allows you as a person holding that for somebody the ability to see all their bitcoin like if I, if you rick give me one of your word seeds and a backup of all the public keys in your multi-sig wallet i can see all your bitcoin now 
Um, so Michael Flaxman, um, the, the creator of this, had the idea, what if instead of just using the, the word seed you give me, Rick, um, what if we just pick really big random numbers four times and we go four levels deep down different random non-standard um, derivation paths and I use those keys instead of the default derivation path keys to make my multi-sig with. And so the key here is for the trade-off of having to never lose those random numbers you use as derivation paths, just like you can never lose all of the public keys involved in the multi-sig, um, you can give me a seed to keep hold of, Rick, and it's set up in a way where I can never see how much Bitcoin you have stored on that multi-sig, what you do with it, unless you give me that derivation path so that I can sign to recover your shit because you lost some of your keys. And so there's like the, the main thing here is like you're adding a new piece of data that you cannot just regenerate from your word seed that you have to keep hold of in order to not lose your money. But you get the benefit of somebody can hold part of your multi-sig and they don't learn anything about your Bitcoins. And you could even do this as a service, potentially. Um, like Casa, Unchained Capital could re-architect systems um, to offer products based around this. Um, but the even funner, interesting thing, there is a way to just use all of the public keys involved to generate that derivation path deterministically. So that as long as you don't lose all of that information, which you have to not lose anyway um, to be able to regenerate the script, um, you can always regenerate the derivation path um, to make it even um, like more resilient against data loss um, to that marginal degree. And you could even go to such an insane degree that instead of just um, you know blinding, so to say, um, one word seed that you use in the multi-sig, if, if you use this deterministic setup or you're willing to never lose this data, you could blind multiple or all of the word seeds in um, that multi-sig so that none of them um, could ever leak information about your coins. And see, the thing is here though, um, how do you stop the backups of all the public keys used to generate the deterministic derivation paths from being found? Shamir, Shamir secret sharing. You can literally encrypt that um, so that every copy of that that you keep with each individual seed is encrypted with a Shamir secret sharing scheme so that you can split up the key to decrypt that. So yeah, in, in, in the TLDR, um, you can go anywhere now from your buddy that has your one recovery key in a multi-sig never learns about your coins unless you have to recover with him to you have some super crazy autist multi-sig scheme where not a single one of your word seeds getting compromised would tell anybody about how much bitcoin you own or anything like that so um yeah this is fucking awesome please god do not let any stupid fringe dumb thing with music two or with frost or whatever threshold scheme we wind up using with schnorr it like doesn't work with this because like this just fucking leveled up multi-sig by like a hundred X. Well, that's good news. Woo -wee! I mean, I know I, I can imagine that of all the wallet developers out there are already thinking about how could they implement something like this? Or like you were saying, like how could a 
provider like Unchained Capital, you know, create a product for their uh, customer with something like this? Because for sure, there's customers that would, you know, appreciate the extra privacy. Yeah, dude, like if they could offer a no KYC service that is literally just the recovery key, that changes everything when I can have them like hold a recovery key that does not tell them anything about my coins. If I don't have to KYC to them, okay, um, I might completely reconsider my reluctance to use any service like that because the whole problem is leaking privacy. Like that's the thing I don't like about services like that personally. If I can interact with a service like that without creating any privacy leak, yeah, holy shit. Boom. Developers, like uh, like you're saying, yeah, like let's make sure that this uh, stays, the ability to make this multi-signatures uh, stays and let's uh, work on developing more of them. But I mean, no, d- dude, like, think about this. Like, like the, the, the last step I want to make is like uh, to have a no KYC policy like this, okay, you have to have um, a verification mechanism. Like, the service needs to verify it's actually fucking you to help you recover your coins if you lost some keys. You know what I mean? If you have the secret derivation path and they don't, and that is mathematically secure enough, that's enough entropy, they can just give out the word seed to whoever asks for it and just not care whether it's actually you or not. Because if there is enough entropy in that derivation path, those people will never be able to generate the keys they need to actually move anything without that derivation path. Like this literally, if you you really sit and think this through, this completely changes everything in terms of multi-sig and the, the, the spectrum of options that people who use it have available to them. So... Don't you think like exchanges should be looking at this and trying to make sure that, I mean, just talking about the travel rule and like, you know, virtual asset service providers and all this stuff just a second ago. And a lot of that has to do with custody and like uh, being able to find information like if the exchanges could implement something like this. Um, that just seems like it would be a big win for everybody across the uh, user base. I mean, I'll take just any kind of recovery service, but like, Dude, this seriously, it's like, it gets nuts. Like, and and imagine like, you know, mostly I've just been talking about recovery services. Like one of the example that um, Michael gave in the spec breakdown for this, imagine you want to leave some coins um, to somebody's inheritance. Um, You can give them the keys to recover that but give the derivation path information to like a lawyer or the executor of your estate or something so that your heir, they don't even have any clue what they're going to inherit until that happens. Well, it sounds like this could help like uh, in a lot of different facets. So I hope uh, everybody out there is listening and yeah, dig into the, the show notes and look into this and figure out how you can iterate with it. So, what the next? Virgil Griffith? Some sort of update? Some kind of case? Something. Who picked that one up? Yeah, so in previous episodes, 200, 201, 202, 232, and 254, we have covered the U.S. government's case against Virgil Griffith, head of special projects at the Ethereum Foundation. He was arrested and charged in November 2019 with attempting to aid North Korea in evading sanctions, and he was denied permission by the State Department to travel there for a blockchain conference, and he went anyway, uh, which is how he ended up getting arrested. I Um, remember now. Yeah. The last time we talked about this in January, his motion to dismiss the case has been denied. Uh, On July 9th, a few weeks ago, the United States attorney, Audrey Strauss, wrote on behalf of the government to the judge, 
uh, to notify the court that the defendant has violated his bail conditions. In direct contravention of those conditions, the defendant recently attempted to access one of his frozen cryptocurrency accounts containing assets of nearly a million dollars. The defendant has posed a serious flight uh, or a serious risk of flight from the outset of this case, and his recent attempt to access his frozen cryptocurrency assets indicates that with trial now approaching, the risk of his flight has intensified to an unacceptable level, and that he lacks regard for the authority of the court and the conditions it has imposed to mitigate that risk. Absent an explanation, the authority of the court or absent explanation justifying the defendant's conduct, and the government is presently aware of none, the defendant should be remanded pending trial. The government respectfully requests that the court schedule a conference at the earliest possible date to address the defendant's violation and the government's request for remand. Um, and there are several additional documents in the docket now that pertain to this matter. Uh, one second while I scroll. So uh, on July 16th, um, about a week ish later uh virgil's lawyers responded to the letter from strauss uh, opposing the allegation that he had violated his bail conditions quote given the impending trial date mr griffith may need to sell certain assets on his legal defense mr griffith consults closely with his family on financial matters and did so even prior to his arrest in connection with their strategy to assess and uh, assess and access necessary resources to fund his defense and after consulting counsel his mother made an online request to access a u.s based and regulated cryptocurrency exchange coinbase referenced as the exchange in the government's motion defense counsel reasonably believed that mr griffith's parents accessing an account on his behalf for this purpose would not violate any provision of the bond order mr griffith and his parents therefore acted consistently with their understanding of the conditions of the bond as informed by what they understood pretrial services permitted and and after Mr. Griffith consulted counsel, this matter has no connection to any risk of flight. And then in a supplemental letter, they included the full message that Griffith's mother sent to Coinbase, which is, I presume my account was restricted due to the pending legislation at, or pending litigation against me. My lawyers now tell me that it is permitted for me to access my cryptocurrency on Coinbase. If you'd like to speak to her, Carrie Axel, which is his lawyer, um, and then provides the email address. You can also reach me at redact. I, I don't know if they provided the email address. It might be redacted or via phone number. Related, I'm going to need the 2FA removed as the FBI took my devices away, end quote. Um, so this is the note that his mother sent to Coinbase. And um, yes, uh, the government's response uh, on July 20th, there was a bail review, and the court concluded that the, the defendant violated or attempted to violate paragraph 14 of Judge Broderick's bail order, document number 8, in which he was specifically prohibited from accessing any of his cryptocurrency accounts. Though the defendant is a bright, well-educated man, his method of circumvention of the order was neither clever nor effective. He claims that he used his mother as... Uh, he claims to use his mother to act as an assistant to access the internet on his behalf, um, the electronic message he sent through his mother was written in the first person claiming his lawyer had told him it is permitted for me to access my cryptocurrency in Coinbase. Uh, I'm going to need the 2FA removed as the FBI took my devices away. Uh, while his lawyer was willing to say that she told her client that she saw no issue in his using his secretarial using the secretarial arrangement for some purposes, she never went so far as to claim that she told her client that it is permitted for me to access my cryptocurrency on Coinbase. The court finds by preponderance of the evidence that there is no conditions or combination of conditions that can reasonably assure the defendant's presence at trial. He is remanded to the custody of the U.S. Marshal pending trial. Wrecked. Sucks. Also, why did they leave their money on Coinbase? Like, Virgil, are you stupid? So there is a little bit of Wait explanation. I'm sorry. Re re I'm sorry. That that was a dumb question on my part, Jimmy. Of course he's stupid. He went to North Korea. Well, so, so the explanation they give is that at the time before he was arrested, the Ether, and it is Ether, that is the cryptocurrency in question, um, the Ether was worth $100,000, and since then it grew to a million dollars. So, um, yes, he had $100,000 when he was still a free man on Coinbase. Um, the government does say i think it was in one of the documents from the government the government says that coinbase notified them of 
the, this request from Virgil slash his mother, which is how they found out that he was trying to access the funds there. Um, of course, Coinbase is a snitch. No surprises there. They are a, as as I think Virgil's lawyers even say in their letter, a fully regulated exchange. Um, that is what fully regulated exchanges do. They snitch on their customers to the government. It's financial surveillance. Duh. Not your keys, not your coins, also not your personal information uh i'm surprised uh i am surprised that griffith's defense and or family didn't handle this more carefully like if it was me i would have just said like i would have just been point blank and told the government or asked the government if it was okay to regain access to his ether and coinbase to avoid the possibility of allegations like this because very clearly they did not inform the government they it sounds like they talked to pretrial services which I, that is a, that like is a, that's part of the court service. Like it's someone that communicates with the court or the, the bail stuff. Uh, but I don't think that's equivalent to communicating with the government. Um, so I feel like they should have just asked before doing that. And also like, I, I mean, maybe Shinobi, you know more about this, but I'm pretty sure that when people have, had internet restrictions put on them it is not considered a uh legitimate workaround to just say well my mother was the one typing therefore it's okay um i don't i don't know if that has ever worked or if that's ever <laughs> a uh legitimate do you I know mean, or not I, my homework. I would assume in the context of like i need to find this recipe to cook dinner but not in the context of trying to access the exact type of digital services that you were specifically ordered by the court to not access in the first place. Um, I believe the recipe clause, however, falls under humanitarian <laughs> use of the internet under the UN Convention of approximately 2004. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, I. Yeah, I I would be surprised if this kind of scenario hadn't happened before where someone is told to not use the internet and then they just I don't I don't know how far the restriction goes of like can you be can know. you as long like, as you're not the one typing does that I, count? I have no I've idea. I've seen Kevin Mitnick stand in front of and watch things on computer screens and video before while he was on probation and like go if i touch this i go back to jail and he didn't touch it so like i i honestly don't know where the line is there i mean i i definitely think that um trying to access over a million dollars worth of a crypto asset is probably skating the line of this is not uh this is not a workaround that we accept i, I assume that's the answer here can we deconstruct what trying to access means in this case because does that mean that tried to move funds from address controlling to some other address and somehow somebody had already stepped in to make sure that would not happen well so Part of, one of the documents also states that I think part of the reason they consider this to be a red flag is because he, they think that he still has crypto assets stored somewhere in Singapore, which is where he was living, and they either haven't finished accessing those or they are not sure that that is that consists of the entirety of his assets and i guess they are super concerned about wanting to secure those and so maybe they weren't even aware that he had crypto assets on coinbase in the first place and so finding out this way maybe tick them off i don't know but it seems like i don't know i mean yeah uh it could also be a dirty trick to prevent him from being able to fund his own defense because clearly they are going pretty hard after him. They've denied all of his motions to dismiss things. So, um, yeah. That would be my guess. It's like, you know, this is defense funding. Like they would probably access to those funds probably means could you cash it out and pay some lawyers? Yeah. I mean, I think in this scenario, if they had done this at all, I think they should have. 
I mean, I, I, yeah, with this kind of case, like there, there's, there's also a document that talks about like classified information. I would have to read that more carefully to see how relevant that is. But, um, that was quite interesting to me that the government was basically putting forth, it was some kind of motion to classify information and not give certain information to, to the defense. I don't know if that implies that there was some kind of intelligence operation involved in this. Um, I don't think there has to be because, like I said, Coinbase is a snitch. All they have to do is send an email to the government saying, hey, this person who uh, you currently uh, have, uh, you're currently trying to prosecute, is, ha we got a message from someone claiming to be them trying to access their money. Uh, you should know about that. Um, so they don't really need like an intelligence operation to uh, to uh, find out more information about this. Uh, but that was an interesting document to see that they are trying to keep some information secret. Um, yeah. I have it's no a weird doubt. case. Yeah, if you're a federal agency that would really like to watch somebody's Coinbase activity, you can essentially get live callbacks from activity on their account. But yeah, um, yeah, uh, delete Coinbase. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, if you didn't get out the first time. So All right. I think it's that time where we talk about um, New Jersey being mentally challenged. Cease yeah. and desist. Seems that way. I mean, uh, the New York, or the New Jersey Attorney General, yeah, they've been um, sending some letters to BlockFi, and uh, it's, yeah, in the news here. So let me get down to what I got in the notes here. So it's uh, related, they're, in the news because it's related to a potential uh, regulatory shutdown to BlockFi. CEO Zach Prince received a cease and desist letter from the New Jersey Attorney General on July 19th regarding their BIA accounts, their BlockFi interest accounts. And uh, Zach said in a Twitter thread, quote, We remain fully operational for our existing clients in New Jersey. All aspects of the BlockFi platform continue to be accessible to our clients in New Jersey. The order calls for BlockFi to stop accepting new BIA clients residing in New Jersey beginning July 22nd, 2021. And BlockFi is engaged in an ongoing dialogue with regulators to help them understand our products, which we believe are lawful and appropriate for crypto market participants. BIA is not a security, and we therefore disagree with the action by the New Jersey, uh, New Jersey Bureau of Securities. We will continue to engage with all relevant authorities to protect our clients' interests and ensure our products remain available. Close quote. Then on uh, BlockFi's website, there is a statement that goes into a little more detail on the matter. It says, uh, quote, On July 19, 2021, the New Jersey Bureau of Securities issued a summary cease and desist order finding that the BIAs are unregistered securities under New Jersey law and seeking to stop BlockFi from opening new BIA accounts worldwide. Nothing in the order precludes BlockFi from paying interest on existing BIAs or refunding principal to BIA clients. BlockFi disagrees that BIAs are securities and is engaging in discussion with New Jersey Bureau of Securities and other regulators in this regard. The New Jersey BOS Bureau of Securities has agreed to extend the effective date of that order to allow the in New Jersey BOS additional time to consider BlockFi's position and submission of information, and also to enable BlockFi to address technological issues implicated by the order. The parties are continuing to engage in discussions regarding this matter. Securities regulators in Texas, Alabama, and Vermont also have issued orders regarding this issue. Close quote. So it sounds like uh, BlockFi is currently in a regulatory bout with various officials who have been trying to flex their muscles in the space for a long time now. New York and New Jersey seem to have attorney generals who are very close to an or order trying to bring control to crypto economics. And uh, this fight ties into a broader fight that relates to any other interest-bearing account systems like Uniswap and 99% of all the DeFi 
out there. As much as I'm an individual focused on as as much as I'm an individual focused on Bitcoin and its development, this doesn't look good for the broader ecosystem or for individuals living in jurisdictions to enforce this level of market control. But I mean, it is just like the same thing like we've seen as far as like the New York Attorney General just blasting it tether over and over and over again for years until, you know, I mean, it hasn't done anything. So, I mean, uh, it could be a big nothing burger, but what do you guys think about this? Uh, I wonder why they haven't taken any such similar action for any other platform trading all kinds of shit that's technically securities or projects that are securities. What's their hard on about uh, BlockFi about? Um, like I really kind of wonder one, um, how popular credit unions are in New Jersey and two, like what the overall bank deposit situation is looking like in New Jersey. Like what's, what's all the, what's all the, the, the fuss about if a savings account can pay out interest on shit cause it's being lent out. What's the, what's the problem with BlockFi doing that? Huh? I guess personally, I'm not clear on how what they offer would be construed as a security, um, just because it operates so much as an account of sorts in that you can transfer value in, you can take value out of it, you get a yield at various tierings uh, on it. Um, it. It's definitely interesting that they bothered to make it, but sounds like good fun, I guess. Oh yeah, there's thought- a there's a Forbes article in the show notes where it kind of like uh, details it out like BitConnect 2.0. I thought it was fun that that Forbes article has a quote from the CEO of BlockFi in it where he says the company has no knowledge of any impending actions with the New Jersey Attorney General. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I, I'm not quite sure why Black Vi is getting beat up today. It just seems like somebody took stupid pills from my point of view. Like, yeah. Somebody has been trying to kick Black Vi's loan loss provisioning, like how much they have to set aside for future losses, way the fuck up. And they've done it in a couple of cases. Black Vi might have done it to themselves. And uh, here's one more. Yeah. I'm sure they're all seeing I plant your guy will fix things. <laughs> yeah, but I guess before we slide along to uh, the next one, though, it is a lot later than usual uh, for Janine, so I think she's going to come poop out here for a minute. How feeders in. Aww, later. Toodaloo. Bye. Guten Schlafen. Don't don't blow things up while I'm on. No more autism allowed. Hey, we don't put pressure on you for your dreaming time. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get the explosives. All right, so. <laughs> All right, now that the girls are gone. All right, it's time to break out the whiskey and start talking about chummy and this and chummy and that, right? Okay, Xiaomi and eCash, drink. So, there is a new proposal for a Xiaomi and eCash system drink um, called Fediment. And this is really interesting for two specific reasons in my mind. Um, one, they are aware of Frank Braun and the Smuggler's um, Script Cash implementation, which we've talked about here before. Um, in terms of all the different Xiaomi and eCash um, designs drink. Um, <laughs> but there, from my understanding, um, the idea here is to build a little off of that um, in the federated direction. Script Cache's implementation, if I remember correctly, had actually individual um, signatures per token input for each member of the federation that signed on it. So let's say you have a three of five federation. Um, there's going to be three separate signatures from each mint um, for every operation, at least. Um, so that gets a little expensive in data terms. 
I do believe Fediment is using a um, multi-party computation, like Musig-like um, scheme. So it should wind up with a single um, signature that proves whatever threshold from the Federation is signing off on things. But also, two, Lightning Network integration so that all the little Xiaomi and eCash servers drink out there um, with different entities running them, different federations, different groups of people trusting them can all talk to each other through the Lightning Network. So that if my little Xiaomi and Mint drink, um, you know, is one you don't trust, but you have one over here that you trust, I can just zap it along through the Lightning Network. And that just works. So, uh, yeah, for fuck's sake, there needs to be more discussion about standardizing and kind of smushing a little bit of Xiaomi and eCash server drink, um, you know, application type stuff into Lightning and, and being interoperable with that. So, yeah, but let's get on it. I have a feeling Lightning will get to host plenty once it uh, is all grown up. With Taproot support. Dude, Galoy is running in El Zante right now a custodial lightning bank for that whole town with no privacy. The operators can see everything. They're just accounts. Give them Xiaomi and eCash and privacy from the operator. Oh my god. Drink. Yeah, this looks like uh, another one of those big improvements that some people need to be working with. This is going to be like studies on native people when this uh, Xiaomi and eCash solution comes along and they get blinded cash to see what percentage of the market naturally flows to blinded. Just build it. Just build it. Alrighty. Are we ready for the last bit of news of the day? Oh yeah, gotta get our uh, our block stream in for the day. Earning that paycheck. Cha ching All right, so um, yeah, uh, block stream has announced a new service, Greenlight, which is effectively a cloud service for people running an actual Lightning node that can stay online all the time, um, watch for malicious behavior, etc., cetera, um, as a service. Now, I'm sure there are many people screaming, that's dumb. Here's the nice kicker, though. Um, they run all of the back-end infrastructure, the Bitcoin node, the watchtower, the actual guts of the Lightning node, but the way to interact with this is through an application you actually run yourself that manages your own private keys and has its own enforcement logic, which I assume, and I just have to say at this point, like these Blockstream blogs, like for fuck's sake, get a little more into the meat of the implementation details so that we don't have to just assume things but I assume is a C Lightning plugin um, using their plugin API that will actually validate what the, the node running in the cloud or cloud is asking your client to sign and will only sign appropriate things that don't just suck your money off into the internet. So this is, I think probably one of the better trust models I've seen in terms of, you know, like spin up lightning stuff in the cloud very simply and easily. Um, just in the sense that like you are giving up privacy to whoever is running this for you. Like they are running the thing that hosts your channels. They can see your channel balances because that information is there in case the thing running in the cloud has to react to stuff like that is what it is 
but nothing can be signed without the client you're running on your own hardware actually signing off on that. So it's kind of, you know, say goodbye to privacy a bit here, but you know, the security of your funds is still, you are the one in control of keys. And so far, there are two things implementing this. Um, last bit, um, a newer thing still running on testnet only that looks kind of like a, uh, a web lightning wallet um, that built out a web interface for this. Um, so you can just pop in a browser, get this running and hooked up to the cloud infrastructure that Blockstream is going to run. And um, Sphinx Chat um, has actually worked on integrating this so that um, this can be your solution for actually having a lightning node to be able to utilize that. Uh, now, one thing I do want to point out, and I really hope that this happens very quickly, is the potential for the client that you run talking to the green light node um, to actually encrypt and hide all of the payment details from the actual node that Blockstream is running. Um, now I'm assuming right now the way that this works is it's just a client blindly pushing data to the node on the back end, which would reveal um, payment details, where the payment is going. But there is no reason that the client and how it communicates with the back end can't be tweaked so that the back end that Blockstream is running in the cloud FUD, you cheeky fucker in the text box, um, would only see the next hop and not actually learn where the payment is going. So you can kind of improve a little bit the privacy model here in the sense that Blockstream isn't going to learn where your payments are going, but they're still going to be able to see things like your channel balance, how money's distributed in the channel, and so on. And they're also looking at um, more granular kind of verification um, between the client you run and the infrastructure um, or the node that they run in the cloud to kind of make that a little more granular in different clients being able to do different things when um, talking to the backend. So definitely a lot of trade-offs to consider here, but I think this could still wind up being something incredibly useful. And I, I see a lot of potential to improve the privacy model a little bit. Um, at least in the sense of not just doxing the block stream every payment you make and where it's going. Do you think the block stream AI in the cloud could potentially be a threat to humanity's future? I don't know what you're talking about, John Connor. I have come from the future. <laughs> It's like you, 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 sh you should see what I'm saying. Like, but you're, you're a developer. Like, the, the kind of flexibility for something like this to make it a lot more simple and easy to set up services or you know shit running on Lightning where you at least still have your keys in your control. You know what I mean? If not a lot of the backend infrastructure. Yeah, they're definitely going to come as they're demanded. I mean, I think it's definitely going to help as far as uh, hacking together some, you know, uh, some stuff with this uh, last bit and uh, Sphinx chat. It's a pretty interesting uh, way to just get people using those sort of services uh, more often. Yep. Potentially. Alrighty, so call it. This is final thoughts time. Yes. Tis final thoughts time. Bud, Rick, go. Let me tell you uh, this story, children. <laughs> on, on Wednesday, I decided after receiving an email a week or more ago. Hold on, your mic's all fucked up now. 
Oh god, it, it's because I was lounging. I I was getting into like grandma kickback storytelling mode. I didn't want to go there. Uh, I will be attentive and speak to you directly, soldiers of the revolution. Uh, so I actually registered for my Block Fi Visa credit card to interface with the legacy financial network uh, last Wednesday. And amazingly enough, there was a FedEx package for me on Friday that contained my new BlockFi credit card, which I dialed the phone number to do the uh, processing for, so I didn't have to get out my 2FA shit and deal with all that. Um, and they asked for so many things, and then it failed to authenticate me. And it was transferring me to a human representative, at which time I had finally got my 2FA going, logged into the website, validated, and, uh, you know, activated my credit card. So since then, I have unashamedly earned whatever the kickback is for using Cuckbucks to buy things uh, in Bitcoin terms. And I, I would just like to throw out as a, a simple uh, thought experiment to the audience, if, uh, if the yield on something like your spending on, on, or on much of your spending that ultimately comes across some sort of US dollar transfer wire thing, whether you're buying groceries or uh, restaurant food or any given service or whatever you like, um, if you get a kickback on that, like on your standard credit card of, of say one and a half percent, and you get that in the well mythologized 100% increasing on average per year Bitcoin unit of account, then I would just posit to everybody out there to sit down and think about that geometric progression of 1.5 to three, to six, to 12, to 24, to 48, to 96. And then just think about how, like if that's how you're spending your money anyway, it's almost like you're loading something that's revolving that is ultimately just accumulating value over time for you. Anyway. Sorry, I, I got down the rabbit hole of uh, compound interest there. Uh, wh what are you guys up to? Filling out a Block 5 Visa credit card application. Ching, 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 right. ching, ching. Everybody, Rick and Fudd have clearly been compromised by Block 5. <laughs> the special ops team came in and raided me in Cossatious Coins. No. Yeah, haven't been bought by BlockFi yet. I was gonna do. I actually was gonna sign up, but uh, you know, I'm just like so paranoid. Like I, like I was getting uh, the connection to verify. Like, oh, you know, you're signing up, and I'm like, gosh, thinking about the data breach and like you know potential hacks in the future. But you know, yeah, 1.5 percent on spending and BTC. Like, come on. I, I think it's great, and to be quite honest, and you know, not hyperbolic. There's a lot of people out there that have focused on credit card points, whether they're airline miles or whatever they are, and the kickbacks from having a credit card in quite a while, uh, for quite a while. And uh, I welcome all the ladies to come get their sats back and uh, join the club. <laughs> all right, Rick, give, give us a right. final thought. All right, here's one. Let's, let's escape this block fight commercial. Okay, so... It sounds like Jeff Bezos is going to back Bitcoin in Amazon. That's my final thought. I'm <laughs> just I mean, I, I mean, my final thought really is like, let's keep Bezos out of Bitcoin. But I mean, I keep seeing all this talk on Twitter right now about Amazon and Bitcoin. And uh, I mean, like Cardano is trending because of it. I'm, I mean, who gives a shit? All right. Well, I guess my final thought, guys, is I have realized the errors of my way. I have actually come to accept deep in my heart that shorting Bitcoin in any way whatsoever 
is an immoral act. So from this moment forward, <laughs> I can never pay rent. I can never buy food. I'm going to be setting up a shanty shack in the middle of the woods and illegally hunting deer without a hunting permit because any kind of expenditure whatsoever as an individual who's all in is going short Bitcoin and that's immoral. So if I wind up starving to death, freezing to death, getting arrested for shooting a deer in the woods without a hunting permit or probably even proper hunting gear. It was it was a really nice run guys but i've just decided i have to live or die a moral life well watch out for the sheriff <laughs> right on that note though catch you later punks later everyone Peace. <laughs> Was there, was there, that's a good chance to